Uh, again, Dude, like I go through. I think I should go get the cops board. right now. If they knew he's got, he's been to Iraq <laughs> and Afghanistan. Get this guy out of here. What's going on, guys? My name is Andrew James. Welcome back to another episode of Globe Focus. This week, I got to sit down with my good, good friend Jerome Traveler. Jerome is a travel content creator, photographer, and honestly, just one of the most cultured people I have ever met. As always, thank you for listening to Globe Focus. If there's any countries you guys are itching for me to travel to and talk with some locals from, be sure to reach out to me and let me know on Instagram at Globe Focus. And without further ado, let's jump into the discussion. All right, guys, welcome back to Globe Focus episode, I think five, five or six. And I have the privilege to sit down. This is the podcast. I say this every week, but I mean it genuinely. This is the podcast I'm most excited for because you are a very unique individual, Mr. Jerome Traveler. Yeah. And you've had a real rise. I wonder, I'm wondering how aware you are of like how much of an, I think you, an effect you had on the industry. Cause I watched you when I first met you it was during COVID in New York, you were doing a lot of Spider-Man stuff. And you were more of a photographer helping out other influencers. Is that kind of true? Well, that's kind of how I started. Yeah, I started in photography and I initially was just, just doing this for fun. And a lot of my friends who were already in the industry that were already doing like a full time job out of this were asking me for help. And like I was more than happy to help because one, it was fun. And two, I was getting to learn stuff about how to use a camera in different situations. So, yeah, that's kind of how I started. And it's funny because you you mentioned like the rise or whatever. It's we got to know each other literally right before I, it started taking off. So you saw like my whole journey. Yeah. Right before. And then, and then I just watched you form this whole brand and you, I think like the way you do your Instagram stories, you're the most personable person I think in the travel space because we all know exactly like, even though we haven't seen each other in what, two years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I know exactly kind of what you've done the past right, couple years because yeah. you're vlogging yourself and you're, True. you're very in front of the camera and you have a great on-screen personality. And even when I was talking with like clients, you're just very well known for New York and people feel like they know you. I think a lot of times creators in the travel space, you can't really get to know them because everything they're doing is so filtered. It's, really? You think so? I think so because it's like, even for myself, like I'm so worried about like aesthetic that it's not ever about the storytelling for me. It's more just about the aesthetic of everything. Right. Yeah. And then you don't really get to know who I am. That's why I wanted to start this podcast actually. So people could see what I'm like a little bit more behind the scenes. Whereas you, you're always in front of the camera. Well, the thing is like, you know, it's, it's funny because you mentioned aesthetics, for example, like I still keep like a heavy focus on aesthetics, but it depends on uh, what tool I use on which platforms, because I feel like every tool, stories, reels, uh, regular still photos, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, they all have their different purpose. And so, for example, when I storytell through my regular Instagram stories, whenever I'm documenting a country, I just keep it like raw and natural. I don't force myself to try to make it like a full, like super static documentary vice style, like reporting of a certain country. I just, mm. you know, report in a casual way, in a very raw way, whatever I'm experiencing so that it just comes out more natural. No, it makes sense because the answer is not always cinematic. Mm -hmm. right for a lot of content it's actually better if it feels just real like raw we're gonna i mean this is a good example of the format like if this was for an actual job i would be a lot more worried about like the lighting and the conditions right, yeah and even the camera angles like i just threw these up but because a podcast i know people aren't going to watch a podcast because of a fancy studio mm -hmm. or because of good cinematography at yeah. the end of the day they're going to watch it because if they relate to it or not or what, exactly. what you're yeah. talking about is interesting now there's a certain bar of quality you have to meet but it's the same thing with like Casey Neistat. Like his videos have never been the most cinematically beautiful videos, but they've been better than that because yeah. they've been, he's just doing the right kind of quality for the format, I guess is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Like he focuses a lot on conveying the right story. And I feel like he puts a lot of effort into the stuff that you don't necessarily see, like setting up the shot from different angles so that you can convey the story in a more like seamless way. And he focuses a lot on the nature of the, the story that he wants to convey and not necessarily you know making it super cinematic or even going the extra step when it comes to making um a certain visual storytelling like aesthetic yeah in terms of even you know if i am to go down the, the more technical stuff like he never shoots in like uh log format and color grades and stuff like that really he doesn't i know for his vlogs like what? he never does that yeah it's always oh more like God. casual and like just running gun shoot but he focuses a lot more on the storytelling and I think people subconsciously don't notice all the efforts that he puts into the storytelling, but ultimately that contributes to people enjoying the content because it's so 
well told in a very seamless way. Take us through, let's not do your whole life because I did that on the past few podcasts and it just starts to take too long. So take us through these past couple of years from where you were starting in COVID to where you're at now as far as what you're doing. Well, yeah, COVID was a very weird year for, I guess, everyone. Yeah. Um, but I used to work in sports before COVID and I was pretty set on that being my life, my career, because I started working for this team called Paris Saint-Germain uh, in Paris, which is the biggest sport. You're, team. For the people who don't know, you are, we'll get through this later, but just for initial context. I'm half French, half Japanese. And you live so in So my York. dad is French, my mom is Japanese. I currently live in New York. Um, I lived in many different places, but more recently, like right before COVID, I was, li- I was living in Paris first, where I was working for the football team over there. And then I moved back to New York, where I was also working for the football team in the international office. And yeah, as I said, like uh, I was pretty set on that being my life, my career. I had stepped foot in the biggest sporting entity in France, one of the biggest in Europe. Um, and when you're passionate about sports, it's like, you know, if you start working for the Lakers or like uh, one of the top teams in the American uh, sports leagues, you're pretty set. You're like, okay, I've made it into like where I want to make it to. And uh, I quit my job a little bit before COVID, uh, trying to find like another job within the, the sports space. Mm. And then that's when COVID hits and there was absolutely no sporting events, uh, oh my no God. recruitment. So like all the HR people, they put hold on, Man, on so recruitments. I, I really did see you right when this all started. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy yeah. to me. So wow. during COVID, I was uh, jobless. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just doing some online courses on the side. Just but you were also online. a photographer established on Instagram. Well, I was How doing photography. You, have? you were... No, not much. I mean, what was it like? Twenty k. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, you. Yeah, were. but then so now after New York, after all that, you started working with Beautiful Destinations, and you started making a lot of your own content. And with reels, like you said, he started to blow. Up. You blew up on Instagram, and you've just been having a lot of reels ever since. And you've been traveling around basically everywhere. Um, yeah, take us through those three years. Like, what was what was that like for you? You've always traveled a lot, though, right? Well, I yeah, I used to travel like whenever I could. Um, you know, even when I was in, in university, I was the stingiest person ever to try to save like every penny so that I can travel a little travel. bit during the summer. Yeah, uh, like, yeah. you know, the cheap um, backpacking in Southeast Asia or whatever it was. And I've always, of course, enjoyed traveling, but working nine to five when I used to work in sports, it was almost impossible to take a little bit of time off to, to be able to travel. But, you know, whenever I had like a long weekend, I would try to do that. And then COVID was like a weird year where everyone was kind of like on a break right, and right. I wasn't able to proper travel either. And then from the end of 2020 onwards, I started, you know, with the rise of like reels and everything, I started getting opportunities. So being able to travel a little bit with BD or with just by myself with some yep. other companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it started picking up bit by bit. Um, I have to say in the beginning, there was a lot of like trips that you would take for free, um, unpaid trips. Uh, that are fully covered, but you try to take advantage of that, to create your own content and build your brand and everything. And then as I continued creating content, traveling a little bit, I was really putting a lot of focus on building my own personal brand. And I feel like that's one of the most important things. Like people don't put enough focus on building a brand and they just don't think properly about the type of content that they want to put out there. And their branding is a little bit all over the place. So I get a lot of friends that ask me like, how do you get companies to pay for your travel um, or how can I connect with uh, this company or that company so that, you know, I, I can travel as well and get paid to travel. But people overlook how important branding is. If your branding is all over the place or if you don't have like one specific clear branding, then brands are also going to be confused as to who exactly they're hiring, right? So like if they're hiring someone who's like doing specific like FPV um, droning, for example, then they know what to expect. And okay, if we need like some digital assets um, and some very like unique type of droning in our destination, then we're going to hire this specific person to take care of that. If they want to hire someone who's more of like, you know, focusing on food content, then oh, we want to showcase the culinary experience in our country or the gastronomy in our country. We're going to hire this person that focuses on uh, the food scene. So I feel like people put don't put enough effort or don't put enough attention into branding and into um, conveying sort of like the right message whenever they travel and their branding is a little bit all over the place. Yeah, totally. I think that's really important. I mean, even like 
I remember I really wanted, so when I first started at BD, I was a full-time creator there. And the problem, I hadn't traveled at all when I got there. Like I'd only been out of the country once when I was like 16. I went with the, my family on a cruise to the Bahamas. I hadn't traveled anywhere before. And so I got to BD and I was like, oh, this is my time to shine. Like it's time to get out there. And unfortunately they had a big US contract going on at the time. So most of the shoots I was getting put on, although they were really fun and it was a great way to learn, they were still in the US and I really wanted to get out. I did a few international trips during my time full time there, but then eventually I left BD and went contract and I was like, man, I want to start traveling. Like I want to get jobs traveling. And I remember what I did is I finally just started booking trips for fun. Like instead of waiting for a company to hire me to go travel, I just started traveling and filming it and kind of acting like I was on shoots during my travels, like kind of hinting as if I was on a production in these countries when in reality I was just just there by myself. Well, even if you're not, like, that's kind of how you have to treat it. Even even if you go on a personal travel, you have to kind of treat it as like an opportunity for me to create content and to create like a branding for myself. So in a way, like even on your personal travels, you have to take it seriously and start creating like your best content so that hopefully in the future, some of the companies would see it and be like, okay, we want this kind of content in our country as well. Let's hire this guy to send him over. No, literally. I mean, that's exactly what happened is people started seeing me and they go, oh, this guy's someone who shoots travel content. Let's hire him for that. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. But I bet you relate to this too. It's a really good point about how, because a lot of times people ask me, are you, where are you going next week? And I'll tell them, uh, they're like, oh, is it for work or is it for fun? And I'll be like, well, it's for fun technically, but it's all still feels the same to me. Like a personal trip is basically as much trip fun or as much work as a as a, as a paid job. And I mean, even more so for you, cause you're creating so much personal content. Yeah. Yeah. I try to mix my travels with like work travels and personal travels as well. But you're right. Like whenever I go on my personal travels to countries that I actually want to go to that I know realistically, I'm not going to have any sponsors sending me to those countries. I still treat it as like, I want to proper documented. I want to make sure that I take advantage of the fact that I'm going to those unique countries to be able to document, to share the content and almost as if it was actual work, like try to put the best work out there and, and yeah. put my best of effort. And this is funny. So when people ask you what you do for work, like say you're on a date right now. <laughs> okay, say a girl asks you, what do you do for work? What do you say? No, usually I keep it simple. I just say I'm a photographer and a content creator and I work in, um, I work with travel related companies, whether that's tourism boards oh or God. airlines. Or That's so exotic. <laughs> Hotels. Where are you from? <laughs> no, yeah. That's I say, I actually, ironically, I, I do all video, but a lot of times I'll be like, I'm a photographer. Just to, if I really don't want to like keep talking about it, I'm a photographer. It depends like who you're talking to. Yeah, if I really want to explain it. Because you like, adapt yeah. your speech to like whoever you're talking to so that they can understand you a little bit better. You know, some people don't understand the social media landscape. So for, for them explaining like the whole social media thing and like uh, branding and image um association and stuff like that like that's going to be a little bit complicated so for me the simplest way to say it is i'm a photographer content creator and i created digital assets for travel related companies sick all right man i want to shift the conversation more to travel and i think you're such a wealth of travel experience i mean how many countries have you been to now 60 now but 60 countries. i know some insane. friends who have been to all 197 or however oh my god however many who countries gives a fuck dude it's like 60 <laughs> countries is way more than most people ever see i'm sure a lot of countries duplicates too like you've been to yeah, a few a lot yeah. so let's talk first about the countries that you know the most about i think maybe it would be like japan Japan definitely. Let's do some <laughs> Japan travel tips because what do you think? I mean, there's a huge wave of travelers to Japan recently. I think like, everyone on my Instagram for yeah, the past like, two months. just opened in to October. Japan. So Is I've been getting a, a whole wave of people asking me, where should I go in Japan? What should I do? Yeah. How do I navigate? How do I get around? How, how do you think Japanese tourists feel about like, or how do you think the Japanese citizens feel about this, like this influx of tourists? Because it was probably nice for them for a few years during COVID. Because it just seems like there's so many tourists. Do they have a good way of managing tourism to make sure they don't spread too far? I mean, Japan is a very crowded place. Yeah. Um, Tokyo is the most, the largest city in the world in terms of population, also in terms of size. Um, really? Yeah, it, it gets very crowded. Oh, I but didn't even know that. That's yeah, crazy. A little fun fact for you. <laughs> wow. yeah. Tokyo and the greater Tokyo area, that's the largest city in the world. Oh my God. Both in terms of surface, but also in terms of population. 38 million people. How many, what's, 
Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> What's the population of Japan? It's... 127, I believe. It might be going down a little bit. Japan has like an aging population right, problem. Right, 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 right. But um, that's still a substantial amount of their population in Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. And when you think about the land area that we have in Japan, it's very small, like if you compare it to the United right. States. So, you know, Japan has maybe a third of the population of the United States, but it's so much more smaller than the United States. I know this uh, is a tough question, but here... This is something that could be useful for you, actually, because I'm sure a lot of people, like you say, DM you for Japan recommendations. Well, if someone like if you wanted to just like you can send them this clip to them, what would you say? Like, I'll just send you this clip instead oh, wow. of having to make it up. Where do you think? Like, let's say a seven day itinerary. I know that's that's tough, but I would say probably like Tokyo, Fuji, Kyoto. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the basic tough. Route. It's tough to answer because, you know, um, like the question, what do you recommend, whether it's destination, whether it's gear, whether it's whatever it is, it's very hard to answer on a general basis because, like, you know, what gear do you recommend? Like, I'm always like, it's, it's like you, what job? You can't you can't go into a car a car dealership and say what car do you recommend. You have to say like, uh, what car do you recommend for this purpose? I have a family and I want to be able to take my kids to school, etc. I have this kind of budget. Um, you know, you totally, you, totally. You have it's to a, give a, a little bit question. more specific. So I mean, it's tough, but you know, just to keep it simple for like a seven day itinerary, of course, like the stuff that you can't miss out on is Tokyo, Osaka and Kyoto. And from Kyoto, you can also go to Nara, which is nearby the deer park. And on top of that, if you are like a photographer or you like to create content, of course, like around Mount Fuji, around places like Kawaguchiko or Fuji Yoshida, it's yeah. very aesthetic and very countryside japan yeah so that i will 100 percent recommend seven days is a little bit short to to do squeeze japan. in everything um i'd say usually for tokyo you need at least like four maybe five days um kyoto osaka you might need like three four days if you do it in a speedy way mount fuji you need at least like a weekend um so yeah do you ever do work with asian tourism boards like not through bd does japan do like tourism work japan's tourism board is very so here's the interesting thing Japan doesn't need marketing. Right, that's it what it markets say. for itself, <laughs> and especially well outside of this COVID uh, period. We're right next to China. China has a population of 1.4 billion. So in terms of tourism, like we're always going to have a lot you're, of tourists. You're chilling from East Asia coming to to Japan. Um, yeah, how much? Is, so is there more? Do you think? I guess you might not even know, but would you imagine there's probably more Chinese tourists in Japan than? Than any right now, other kind of. Uh, yeah, I think I think I checked the numbers actually. Uh, Chinese tourists and Korean tourists are actually pretty similar. I think it's something around like twenty five percent of tourists in Japan are Chinese, twenty percent might be South Korean, and then the rest it divides between a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia, like Malaysian, Singaporeans, Thai people. They love to travel to uh, to Japan, Vietnamese as well, and then there's a lot of like Western tourists as well, Americans and people from Europe. Um, when when a, when a you know when an American or a, a, a European person travels to Japan, I can easily understand like what they're thinking about how different it would be from their perspective because that's who I'm where I'm from. But like when a Chinese tourist goes to Japan, what is it? What are what are the big differences? Do you think for them? I think I think everyone travels for a different purpose. I feel like a lot of the people in East Asia already who travel to Japan. They travel for a few of the reasons. Might be food, for example. Mm -hmm. like yeah, East that's Asian a good people reason. are like yeah. everyone in East Asia is a foodie. Yeah, and everyone loves to go to different places in Asia to taste like the authentic food. Yeah. So a lot of people go to Japan for food. Obviously, shopping is a big thing. Like there's a lot of Chinese people who Chinese tourists who come to Japan just to shop. Yeah. Um, and of course, like everything that surrounds that, like nature and stuff like that. Whereas, like you know. Um, I think that, for example, American tourists who come to Japan, it's more for like, they want to experience the cultural shock. Of and Asia, because they probably, it's yeah, for a lot of exactly. Americans who go to Asia, it's going to be Japan. And a, and a lot of people who are interested from the United States to go to Japan, it's because they know a lot about Japan from the outside because of like anime culture, Media. like the food as well, and all the stuff that they hear about Japan, but they want to experience it. It's like the themselves. obvious, it's the yeah. obvious place to go. Whereas like there's a lot of, for example, Chinese tourists who go to Japan and they keep going to Japan all the time because they just like the food experience and the shopping. That's just an example. Japan was crazy. I got to go. Um, that was my first trip out of the country, actually. When was I, it? And it, we left the day wow. I turned 18. And it was really it was really fun. It was the biggest culture shock of my life, for sure. I loved it, though. I mean, Japan is, like, kind of magical. I love... Was like, that work? Huh? Was that work? Or it was, that was for just BD. Personal? Yeah. It wasn't for a job, though, weirdly. It was like a... It was a 
it was something I don't know. We went out there and shot a bunch of stuff, but nothing ever became of the content. But it was really fun. Uh, I love the my favorite thing is the Seven Elevens. Oh yeah, the Seven Elevens are great. Do you have your Seven Eleven socks? Uh, I don't have my my. Uh, oh, I was Family Mart socks, but I, oh, Family I don't Mart, have them. Yeah, 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 but Same I idea, made like okay. a whole series of stories and and um and content around. 7-Eleven in Japan and convenience stores in Japan and how they're amazing. It's difficult for me to what are, explain. I'm sorry. What are the triangle like sandwiches called? The rice triangle? Oh, the onigiri. How do you yeah. say it? Onigiri. Onigiri? Or onigiri, if you say it. Onigiri. In the American, <laughs> American way. Yeah. The American. But it's basically like triangle rice balls. But I think they're the like ultimate shoot snack because you can just grab them quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're super good. Yeah, but I'm, I, I always have like a... I have to proper explain to my American friends what 7-Eleven is and represents in Japan. Because it's not the same. In- you can't, like, it's, it, it feels like it's a completely different company. It is. It's completely different. In the but United actually, States, you know, 7-Eleven. Honestly, so. I love the American 7-Eleven. Yeah, I do you? smell it because that's where I grew up going. Yeah. So, like, actually, this is crazy. No one's going to believe me when I say this. But I swear to God, my first memory in existence, in life, is a 7-Eleven was it yeah i remember like the when i became conscious i became conscious looking out the window at a 7-eleven while i was going to get slushies with my dad i'll admit to you that 7-eleven is trashy and it smells bad and it's pretty gross in the u.s but like i'm kind of from like a white trash area so (laughs) it kind of it's kind of comforting to me but the japanese ones are on a different level for sure it is like everything from the presentation to what is available you have all the daily necessities you have hot food like bentos that you can have like warmed up inside the 7-Eleven. And it's generally a place that, first of all, it's all over the place in Japan. In you can Tokyo, always find one. In all the whole country. And there's always a 7-Eleven or any convenience stores around the corner. And you can, you actually generally go there on your lunch break, for example, to get food and a meal. And like, you wouldn't really do that in the United States. In the United States, it's no more way. like a rest stop and like, you know, well, you, I, like a I mean, most station. people wouldn't. But to be, to be honest with you, a lot of like construction workers, people like that do go to 7-Eleven in the US. Yeah, to, true. To true. get that kind of but stuff. I but I also it's, feel it's like that's level. because like there isn't that many options when you're they you know, driving around and else. going to rest stops and stuff. Like, okay, cool. Like there's options for you to buy stuff but it's just like a completely different thing in japan where first of all it's like everywhere so you know that around every corner just like starbucks or dunkin donuts in new york you know that there's like one of them somewhere nearby that you can get coffee from in japan it's the same thing there's a 7-eleven or convenience store around the corner somewhere nearby that you can get all your daily necessities food drinks you can buy tickets whether it's like sporting events or concerts oh really even airplane tickets you can go there you can to, buy airplane uh, tickets? photocopy fax or like whatever um more like admin stuff that you need to do what else can you do you can there's clean bathrooms yeah and convenience stores that you can actually use aren't there bathrooms in like the subway too though that you yeah can use? yeah and isn't that that's a, such a crazy concept to anyone who lives in new york like the idea of a subway having a bathroom i mean for me it's the opposite it's a crazy concept that in new york there isn't enough but how long bathrooms. have you lived in new york for about seven years now. Well, 2018, I was in Paris. Okay. But yeah, so I, I guess you have 2016. You've definitely... So break down your life. Where have you spent the most time? Consecutively? In China, actually. I lived China? In, yeah. <laughs> He's so full of surprises. <laughs> I, can't, I can't pin you down. I'm trying to get a mental image of your life. Where I lived you? in Beijing with my parents when I was a kid. Really? 2002 to 2008. Yeah. So that was consecutively six we, years in We China. can cut this out if you want. But do you mind if I ask, like, what, why, like, why were your parents always moving everywhere? Uh, well, it was mainly because of my dad's job. He kept okay. moving around and uh, um, getting jobs in different countries every couple of years. So us as was a family, there a reason for that, or is it just? Uh, well, he was just working in an industry that allowed him to like move around and. Okay. Uh, and he's and French, right? Yeah, he's French. And so yeah. you were just getting to you. So from the beginning, you've been going to crazy. I, mean, you're just probably, like, I think you might be like as cultured since, as you can be. Yeah, I was moving a lot since I was a kid. And my parents also enjoyed traveling to neighboring countries. Whenever, for example, we're living in China or in South Korea, in Hong Kong, they enjoyed traveling to, like, say, Mongolia because it's right there, to Uzbekistan because it's also right there. And then we traveled a lot in, like, Southeast Asia. So that definitely gave me the taste of traveling and discovering new cultures and i was definitely interested in that since i was a kid um that's incredible i mean i literally think you might be like the most cultured person ever <laughs> dave's over here my friend dave is i'm, I'm definitely one of the most wild. international people that you ever meet i've got three passports and three passports you have a u.s passport yeah fucking hell. i've got all the most powerful ones i've got the u.s one the french one the japanese one <laughs> that's a great lineup dude that's crazy um what do you think so i mean you know you've been around the world and back and you've lived in a bunch of different countries. 
This is a tough question, but I bet this, you bet, I'm sure you've thought about it a little bit. Like, what do you think, what do you think, uh, what do you think are a few of the things you've learned from this? I mean, people wise, I'll give it, I'll give my example for one. Like my perspective is I grew up all in the U S and then I started traveling when I was 18 and I was scared of different things that the U S had told me to be scared of. The biggest one I've learned about is just, um, not scared, but, uh, like Islam, like the, the Muslims in general, I've spent a lot of Morocco is the country I spent the most time in. I've been to Morocco five times and spent a lot of time there. So I've gotten to know a lot of people who are Muslim. And then I just spent time in Egypt as well. And that was the biggest learning for me was like religion, how similar all religions really are at the core of all of them is just people trying to understand where we are. Um, that's what I've learned. So like what, like those types of human things, what do you think you've learned? Yeah, about? exactly. Well, a human, you yeah. said, <laughs> for me, everyone is a human. Right. And it doesn't matter where you go around the world. Ultimately, we might have like a little bit of differences between cultures, history, right. religion. Right. But ultimately, we're all human. So what we want in life is to be happy is, you know, we all have our differences in like exactly what we're looking for. But ultimately, humans are going to be human. So even if you go to certain countries where you don't speak the language, you can't necessarily communicate. There's always some universal language. Humor is universal. Sports is universal. I always play football. You might call it soccer. But I call it football. <laughs> Well, I always play football whenever I go around the world. Like I, I play football it, with people, when people in do Vietnam. That, they always stop and they go, oh, I mean soccer. But it's like we do realize that you're talking about <laughs> football. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah. not like I don't realize. The sport you play with your foot and a ball. It's not like my next question was going to be like, what's your favorite NFL team? It's right. Like, I know yeah. that you're talking about soccer. Yeah. I think all my friends know by now that when I say football, there's only one football. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but but again, yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of universal language. I always play football whenever I went to Vietnam. I don't speak Vietnamese, but, you know, it's a universal language. Well, like, humor is a universal language. Enjoying food, we might have our differences, but it's still kind of like a universal language. So there's a lot more that we share and we have in common, even with cultures and religions and, and countries and people that you don't necessarily fully understand. There's a lot more that we share in common than differences. So... It's, all, it's almost like even if people are scared of certain countries or, or places that they want to go to or they're scared to go to, ultimately there's more in common than there is differences and we should celebrate and like enjoy and learn about those differences so that we can keep a more open mind about stuff. And I think a, the biggest one that you recently did, like a country that people might be, you know, have some misconceptions about would be Afghanistan. Yep. When did you, when did you go there and how did that come about? I've been wanting to go to Afghanistan for years. It's a wild maybe thing to say. Maybe four or five <laughs> years, yeah. Initially, it was because I saw some of the work from Steve McCurry, which is one of my favorite photographers, and he spent a lot of time over there um, during the, the Soviet Union era um, okay. when they were in Afghanistan. And his work was just amazing, and it was uh, different to everyone else's work because you don't get to see Afghanistan outside of the traditional media, right? Like yeah, most yeah. of the people and, around and this but world. The even though you don't get to see it outside of traditional media, traditional media has painted such a specific picture. Exactly, of yeah. So the only thing you see about Afghanistan and most people around this world, when you mention the country of Afghanistan, like that's all they can think of, like war, terrorism, the Taliban, poverty because that's what they've been fed by the media. Is that true? Yes, it is. Afghanistan is a country that's been through a lot of hardships, a lot of wars and geopolitical conflicts. But is that all there is to the country? Absolutely not. I think a lot of the stuff that I learned through going to those countries is that one, the government is not the people. And two, mm. even the surface that you see, even the stuff that you see on the media is going to be the tip of the iceberg. And then the remainder of the country, there's so much culture, history, and the local culture and the people that you can meet and get to know. And there's so much more to learn about that. Imagine there's 40 million people living in Afghanistan. 40 million? 40 million. That's a lot. That's big yeah. Tokyo. It's, it's pretty much the population of Spain. Yeah. And there's God. a lot of people who live there. That's like when I found out how big Iran was. Yeah, What's exactly. the population? It's huge. 85 right? million. Somewhere yeah, around I was 85 like, million. What? Yeah. They're it's like a, as it's big a huge country UK. in terms of land mass as well. It's but, but in our, my mind, it's like, oh, it's that country in the Middle East, because that's just how I was raised. I'm just being honest exactly. with you. That's yeah. how it was registered in my mind. Yeah. But in reality, it's millions and millions and millions. Which, you know, that it's, it's normal that a lot of people think about certain countries in the Middle East as like, you know, they associate it to certain image that they have, because that's all they've seen yeah. on the media. And so for me, that's why yeah, I'm saying I, that. My, my dad's in the military. Like, I grew up with. Oh, did you? Really? My dad's in the Navy. So like, yeah. I grew up with my dad going on deployments a lot. To right. Afghanistan, exactly. to Iraq. Yeah. Actually, the story, when I was six, my mom was telling me, I was like, where's dad? And she was like, he's in Iraq. He's in Iraq. They kept saying that. 
I was like, a rock, a rock. And I was like, wow, that must be a really big rock. Because I thought she was saying like he's in a cave. Like, yeah. In a rock. <laughs> okay. But no, it's tough for me because because it's like, so I was fed a very specific picture. And yeah. I'm not saying anything bad against my dad, right? My my dad doesn't really understand either. It's a complicated issue, right? But I'm saying well, yeah, it's, it's, I grew up with a very specific picture of the Middle East. Yeah. And, and even him going to Iraq for military reasons, he's going to also have a different experience of the country. And so naturally the stuff and the stories that he's going to tell you from his experience over there is going to be different to my experience, for example, going there in more recent years in different times not as, as a, a tourist. part of a foreign military. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for me, going as a tourist to certain locations, um, I get to learn so much about the history, the culture, and they think, the, they think the you're people. Afghanistan, Afghanistan yeah, Afghanistan yeah. Too, right? And so funny enough, just because I'm half French, half Japanese, I look like people who are geographically from Central Asia because that's what's. In I between. feel like you could be a little bit of basically any race. Sometimes, if yeah. If you really just like committed to it, yeah, 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 maybe I could well, blend in easily. They have a word for that. We were using the word for like talent for for tourism shoots, like master talent. That's what they call them. Oh, really? They say master talent or like big like racially ambiguous talent. They yeah. call it master. Yeah. Talent. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like, these I, are I could the definitely look ones. like a <laughs> Central Asian person. Yeah. yeah, I've been told a lot of times I look Uzbek or. But what was it like on the ground? I mean, in Afghanistan, how were the people there? Well, it was interesting first of all because. Um, I went last year in October, so it's just over a year after the Americans left Afghanistan. And it's during a very complicated, complex uh, geopolitical situation where literally it's the Taliban controlling the country. Yeah. It's a terrorist group controlling the country. That doesn't mean that a lot of shit is going on over there right now. It's probably the best time to go right now if you want to go to Afghanistan because it it's list. peaceful. Go get it's those peaceful. Instagram photos. I wouldn't recommend it to everyone though. Yeah, That's no, it's uh, I'm joking. for me like recommending a country. It's for me recommending a country. It's a little bit complicated to recommend to everyone. I would say if you want to go to Afghanistan, it's if only if you've been to a bunch of different countries and you're well cultured and you're ready for another cultural shock and you're ready to learn about a country's culture, considering the hardships and all the geopolitical conflicts that has been going on that are still going on and that most likely will be, be going on for the next couple of years um but yeah for me it was interesting in afghanistan because i went during a time where you know it's it, it's very still very unstable right we don't know what the future holds no one does but i went there with the specific purpose of getting to learn more about the country than what we've been shown on the media and, and to document it. Yeah, it's documented. Well, and real quick, if what I can just give you, the truth is so cool what you're doing. I think people don't realize it right now, and you might not even realize it fully, but what you are is the closest thing we have to like a travel channel in 2023. Meaning like nobody is watching, your Instagram stories are how people are learning about travel now. Your reels, like you're creating probably the most relevant travel media in a way, which is really cool. One of the most relevant travel medias. Um, and it's, it's basically the same thing as if like 60 minutes was doing a piece on Afghanistan, doing these, these, these countries, like, because you are the media of Gen Z and of 2023. Um, do you feel a sense of responsibility to like really tell it true? Tell the Well, I, I wouldn't say responsibility, Okay, but I just go there with an open mind and just document my experience in the but most like, but raw you're, way. You're good. You are now the media and you are now the one who's painting the picture. So yeah, you... but in a way, like the beauty of social media is just I do whatever I want. So I don't really have a sense of responsibility, but I know that me through documenting my journey and my experience in those countries in the most raw way, you know, very unfiltered, uh, point the camera towards my face and speak about like my experience in Afghanistan or in Iraq, I know that people are going to realize, oh, I didn't know that Afghanistan looked like that. I didn't know that they have beautiful mosques and like incredible nature location. I just thought right. it was like bombs and terrorists and stuff like that. But no, the reality is that yeah. the Afghan food is amazing. Um, Afghan people have an amazing culture. They have uh, traditional clothes that look amazing as well. I also bought myself a set of clothes and I was I walking saw, around in Afghanistan. In, I'll put a video up so you guys can yeah. see. Yeah, well, can that's also the reason why I looked me? local over there. But there's so much more to share. And so, yeah, I went to Afghanistan during like a very strange period of time. Um, but even when I say that the Taliban right now 
are controlling the country and there's a lot of terrible stuff happening in afghanistan like don't get me wrong i'm not trying to uh to overshadow and to hide the terrible stuff that's going on over there about you know women's rights and stuff like that there's still a lot more that you can discover to the country that's beautiful so for me there's a couple of stuff that's important when i go to um places like afghanistan or iraq not necessarily responsibility but the stuff that i want to document and i want to make justice to the country i want to make sure that one i convey the right story about the current situation and i give a little bit of context about the history what's happening right now and how we can foresee the country where we can foresee the country going to in the next couple of years so give a lot of context about the situation um and also explain the other side of the country the stuff that you won't see on the media the stuff that Again, the beauty of social media, I can document whatever I want. I want to show the food, the culture, the people, the sceneries, the beautiful mosques, uh, the different customs that people go through. And just me interacting with the locals, my personal experience of going to places, taking photos, interacting with people, and all of that in the most raw and unfiltered manner so that people can have at least a more complete story of those countries rather than a 90% biased story that is told by the media 100 they make so much sense when you say it that way and you know this is why i think the fact that you shoot on iphone for your stories is so important because it gives a greater sense of this is real and that's why people like if i was doing you don't want to overproduce content like that because that's when people get suspicious now um and i think what you said is really important earlier which is that the people aren't the country and so even if you don't agree with the a country's government that's not a reason not to visit that place because the people aren't the country there's still so many people you can interact with and learn with um so don't let that scare you away. exactly yeah and i'd say my main question that i ask people if they have something to say about you know uh traveling to certain countries right. and whether that may affect you know the government or like the, the taliban or whoever's controlling the, the group is uh for example let's take the example of afghanistan how do you shun the taliban without forgetting about the close to 40 million people who are suffering from the country, yeah, right? Yeah. You cannot just forget about the people no, who are suffering from it. So me, for example, going to Afghanistan and like buying local food, interacting with people. I also did like a, a fundraiser after I went to Afghanistan to try to pay for a school curriculum over there. That ultimately helps the local people. They're super happy. And tourism as a whole helps countries develop from the revenue, from uh, people having a, no, a more open mind to discover those countries. Um, so I never limit myself to certain countries just because of the unique political, geopolitical situation that's happening over there. I think there's a lot more to discover in countries, more than what the media shows you. And it's only by actually going to those countries that you get to learn a lot about the people, the culture, and even the differences, the conflicts. Yeah, exactly. It's always just, it's always just people. Do you think there's anything specific, specifically unique about the Afghani people that stood out to you? Well, that's the thing. You can't. It's difficult to just generalize Afghan people as a whole because Afghanistan, yeah, it's a country with yeah. a bunch of different ethnic groups. Yeah, some people are more vulnerable than others. Um, you can kind of get to understand like how Afghanistan came to what it is right now uh, because of the history, the different countries and the region that affected um, the different um, people coming in for import export for trade, etc. Over the years and the decades. And so Afghanistan is really like a multi-ethnic country. And that's also another reason why there's so much to discover. My people, the way they dress, etc. It's going to be different depending on the region that you go to. Yeah, I think well, that's one of the biggest things that I have had, I've learned is just like generalizing any country is kind of dumb because yeah. they're just so big and there's so much diversity amongst a anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. um, so it, yeah, it's, it's tough to be like Afghanistan people are like this, you know, yeah. it doesn't really work. How about that picture though? You had that real pop off. It was so cool where you took the portrait on, what was that? Oh yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> what was that? The, the last box camera in Afghanistan. So how, wait, so did you know about this guy? Did, he, did you already know so he existed? So I had seen a video that Drew Binsky posted years ago of that guy. And I kind of remembered it in the corner of my head. But then our guide say, said when we were there, and I wasn't thinking about this, but he said, like, hey, like, I know someone who has a very old camera. And then I immediately thought of Drew Binsky's video. And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. So Let's he go. just happened to mention, your guy just happened to be like, yeah, hey, yeah, exactly. that's crazy. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Whoa. And so we, we went to see that guy, and he was using this... 55 year old box camera an afghan box camera that he built himself 
And the most incredible thing is that, you know, through the different regimes that went through Afghanistan, like there was a period of time where taking photos of stuff was forbidden. And so really? um, every camera or like devices that would take photos of stuff, they would get destroyed. So that, that camera, which is 55 years old, handmade from like a wooden box, has survived through different oh. regimes that were trying to, you know, stop people from taking photos of certain stuff. Wow. So that's the other crazy part of that And story. you got your portrait taken on I it? I got my, my own portrait taken, yeah. And you have it, right? Yeah, yeah. I have it at home. Yeah, that's it's on my so desk. Cool. That's so cool. That's so, that's, that's like that's someone who's traveled to 60 countries. That's souvenir I have from cool. Afghanistan. It's, uh, Sorry, say that again? It's my best souvenir that I've got from Afghanistan. I mean, it's incredible. That's such a cool story. And so is this guy a photographer? And it, was he the one who originally bought it? Uh, well, he built the Afghan box himself, uh, but oh. he's been a photographer for pretty much his whole life. That's the So he also showed us his collection of different uh, film cameras that he's been collecting. And, you know, he had some of the old cameras that my great grandfather was using as well. Uh, the same ones from Canon. And he's and just been in Afghanistan this whole time, just yeah. taking photos. Yeah. I mean, exactly. what a life. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, how's the Afghanistan food? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, there's a dish called uh, Kabili Pulao, which is my favorite dish. It's basically uh, a lamb shank with some rice and the rice, they cook it with uh, some vegetable oil, with some um, chopped carrots, raisins, onions, and it comes with a little soup on the side. It's very tasty. And I think that one of the coolest part of the experience is to eat it the same way the locals will eat it. So with your hands, yeah. I feel like that just adds so much to the experience of eating food in certain countries. If you can really like, you know, immerse yourself Embrace in the, the country culture. and eat it the way, you know, just like if you go to Japan and you go to a ramen place, even if you're not familiar with using chopsticks, Use you're chopsticks. still going to try, right? Yeah, of course. Like you're going to try to make an effort because that's how it's eaten. And so that adds to the experience of eating the food in a certain country. So same for Afghanistan, like eating with your hands, even if you're not used to eating rice and meat with your hands, it's a cool experience. Did you guys use a tour company out there? Uh, we had a local guide and a fixer. Did you uh, like hire him privately? Yeah, exactly. Okay, that makes sense. Um, is that what so you would recommend to we, other people? Yeah, you actually Afghanistan. Well, Afghanistan is a very specific country, but you can't really travel for Afghanistan if you don't have a local fixer because you need to uh, go through different paperwork to be able to get authorization to move between different regions and different provinces in Afghanistan. And you also do need like a local person because, you know, they're going to be the ones that help you with translating, speaking a language. Uh, I don't speak Farsi, so of course, like I needed someone to, need someone to help me out uh, whenever you enter the mosques and, you know, people are going to check on you and uh, you need someone to help you. You need someone to be able to talk. Yeah. yeah, so we had like a fixer in Pakistan, which is where we went to get our Afghanistan visa. And then we went to Afghanistan and then he took care of us for 10, 11 days. Did you get in any kind of like trouble coming back into the U.S.? When no. No one even Absolutely mentioned it not. at all? Well, so first of all, when I came back to the U.S., I go through... The customs with my mobile passport which if people don't know it's just like an app on your phone that you can download and they just ask you the basic questions that the customs ask you right so like how much money you're bringing back where did you come back from or actually they don't right. even ask you where you came back from they don't even but ask the basic questions but isn't it do, do, does it not get logged anywhere like jerome has just gone to afghanistan <laughs> I don't think so, no. So is it because you use it? Did you use your Japanese passport? No, I use my my American passports. So really, because I've heard stories. I, I heard stories of people who have had trouble coming back to the U.S. I guess it's because if they use a foreign passport, yeah. If they use like a, so, okay, say yeah, for example, sense. people yeah. like if I went to Afghanistan or Iraq on my French passport, and I was trying to come back to the U.S. on an ESTA on my French passport, then that would probably get flagged because I went to that list of seven countries that the U.S. kind of put on like a blacklist, which I think are Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Syria, um, Libya, Sudan. There's probably one more. That's amazing but, that you know that. Yeah. <laughs> God, I'm out of my weight class. But yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't worried at all. Like I've got the American citizenship. So for me, it's easy to just come back to the United States. And I don't even think about no that. I've even. got my Afghan visa next to my Iraq visa. <laughs> and uh, again, Dude, like I go through. I think I should go get the passport, cops right but... now. If they knew he's got he's been to Iraq <laughs> and Afghanistan. Get this guy. Well, out you know, what? I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm going there legally. Do you do you think it's at this point you've traveled to so many places that like the challenge of these more difficult to get to countries must be rewarding for you. Maybe, yeah. Or at least like the countries that not many people go to. I feel happy to be able to go to those places because they're underdocumented. It's a privilege for sure. So yeah. so yeah, being able to go to a place that's lesser documented. The same way, you know, social media is very saturated. 
and unfortunately i feel like there's not enough creators out there who create unique content it becomes a lot more of like repetitive content yeah the same music the same trends and i feel happier when i create something unique that nobody else has done before just because it's different from anyone else and i just get more like happiness from creating content that's unique so going to unique country i get the same feeling like if i go to bali right now i yeah. could do bali pretty well but bali is like overdone in so, a way, tough. so i went there last year to shoot a commercial and i was shooting for dgi like a launch of their new ronin yeah and me and mike visuals made a very similar video on accident all right in <laughs> bali for the same yeah. launch because it's just bali there's only so yeah. many places i mean to you shoot. know what don't get me wrong like bali if you do it well and if you hit the spots at the right time of the day like you can get like a really good experience no of it's course of fun. course of it's course. beautiful as well but it's not about that what you're saying is travel to these lesser known places is more rewarding because you're making content that isn't as yeah. common on the online. it's more rewarding because of that yeah and two it's more rewarding because you come out of those countries more knowledgeable about those countries and almost, with your own perspective yeah you grow as yeah. a human like you have this like human development and you gain more knowledge and that is very fulfilling to me well especially when you're doing yeah you're doing new countries new things i like traveling like a mix of things I, every trip can't be like I'm out in the middle of nowhere, like learning. I, li I like to travel somewhat ca casually as well. There's a mix, you know, yeah. I'm sure when you go to Paris now, cause you've lived there before, it's very comfortable. You know, everything. I mean, yeah, how long sure. did you live in Paris? I actually only lived in Paris for a year. Okay. About a year. But yeah. you're comfortable there. You know, the city. Yeah. Yeah. Well. I mean, I've been going to Paris for like a Paris long time is... and like Paris is like, it's home for me. People speak French. So, oh man, I, I have 200 days on Duolingo actually. Oh yeah. So I basically <laughs> speak French. No, okay, I don't know any parler en français alors. No, <laughs> I, I'm so bad at it. I just do the bare minimum. But uh, anyways, yeah, uh, I wish I learned more languages. So you speak French, English. Do you speak Japanese? Yes, yeah, I do. Man. French, English, Japanese fluently. It's incredible. And then Spanish and Mandarin at a conversational level. So I can get around in any Spanish speaking countries. Really? Um, yeah. You make me feel so bad. Spanish is, is kind of <laughs> I easy barely when you speak, speak English. Dude. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. It's it's incredible. I think it, you you probably can speak to more people. When as soon as I started getting out of the country, I was like, "Oh, I should have paid attention in Spanish class." I was mm -hmm. like, "Oh, man, this is such a waste because it's so special to be able to speak with people in their own language." I mean, yeah, not that I would sure. know. I've never done it, but But you know what? Like you've probably noticed like once you go to like Egypt or Morocco, just knowing a few words of Arabic or oh, of the local so language, far. it goes, it goes so, so far. Salam yeah. alaykum is like, like exactly. if you say that to them alone, that's like, it's going to make them happy. Exactly. Know? That's that like that gives the first impression. Or even things like if you say like inshallah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Like exactly. they love that yellow Habibi. Like they, exactly. <laughs> it makes them exactly. so happy, you know? Yeah. Even just a couple of words, like it breaks the ice and it helps you get into our conversation. Perfect. For sure. I think actually that's something too. I, I love it's the easiest way to make friends with someone in a new country is ask them how to teach them, teach, teach you their language. It's because everyone likes to teach someone something yeah. and it's something that they know how to do perfectly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people are always excited to share words. I've never been in a country and ask someone to teach me something and had them be like, Oh, no. yeah. they're always excited to teach you. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's a, do you think it's a waste of time for me to learn how to speak French or even attempt no, to? No, never. Because I get so discouraged. I don't know if TikTok or something is trying to feed me, but I understand that I'll never be able to probably speak French at a level where I blend in. But even just learning, because I started learning it because I spent so much time in Morocco, actually. Ironically, yeah. it wasn't to speak in France. It was to speak in Morocco because tons of people there speak yeah. French. So I was like, okay, I should start learning so that I know if they're shit talking. But it is discouraging because I always hear that French is something that I, you're never going to be able to understand. Like something about how even the French that I'm learning here isn't the French actually spoken because it's a more well, old Well, we have a lot of like colloquial words and like expressions that we use in, in France. Right. That is not necessarily taught in textbooks because it's not, you know, it's the but same if, language, But if say, know? say like I learned it on like a conversational level by traveling there and then maybe I say I lived in Paris for like a couple of years, I could probably get to a point where I could speak. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Right. Yeah. At least being able to speak a couple of sentences, like it's always going to be helpful for yeah. me, like language and even like say Spanish, for example, I can speak Spanish. Right. My Spanish is not amazing. If I am asked to you know, debate about a current political situation in a country in Spanish, I'm probably going to struggle, but at least being able to have a, a regular basic conversation with the taxi driver, with someone inside the shop, it's just going to help me a lot navigate through a country and, you know, navigate and, and, with and, ease. 
it really encourages people too. It's really fun, when, yeah, it, sure. especially if, especially something like Arabic. French, not as much because it's more expected. Actually, when I'm in Morocco, a lot of people think I might be French, so right. it won't even impress anybody in Morocco. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's the bummer. I think Arabic is like one of those things because if you're white or you're not clearly Arabic, it's always going to catch them off guard. Yeah, for sure. Have you seen those videos of like the guys in New York in Chinatown speaking Mandarin? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. it's so much yeah, fun, yeah. right? I, I see a lot of those on TikTok. I just East Asian people, for example, speaking Arabic. That's like my wet dream. American like people just, just like speaking in. fluent Mandarin. Catches them off guard. Well, yeah. Corey Faye, you know Corey. She speaks Mandarin. Oh, yeah, but I mean, she's half. She's half Japanese or half Chinese. Yeah, I guess it's not as impressive. But mm-hmm. Still still incredible. I, I think China is really interesting. China is actually number one on my list. I'm working on getting my is it? Yeah, right I'm, I'm dying to go back to China as well. Yeah, I man. haven't had the chance to go back since I left in 2008. Dude, so I would love to do a trip with you if you oh, want yeah. to sometime. Because I'm, I'm working on getting my visa right now. Oh, are you? I want to oh, go. Nice. And so basically, I don't even know if I should put this in a podcast, but I don't care because no one's listening. Uh, my idea, have you ever on TikTok, I keep getting served these random... Oh, maybe I shouldn't tell. But okay, I keep okay, these, these videos I come across and it'll be like a snowy mountain in like the middle of China or it'll be like these it's moody beach in some city in China. Like some unknown something random place. Yeah. It'll just be these like weird and they'll have millions of likes and it'll be all English speaking people like, whoa, this is China. This is crazy. My idea was I, I downloaded one of those videos. and I'm just going to try to go to that exact spot. And be right. Like, is yeah. this a real place? I That's- follow this account on Instagram that just shares a bunch of lesser known spots in China because China is a there whole continent. There must be continent. so many, right? China is a whole continent in itself. And when you think about the fact that in China, they don't have like Instagram, Facebook, yeah. and it gets shared on all the Chinese Weibo, social right? media, but it doesn't get shared on the other like American social yeah, media. Can you, can like it, we're can, missing can out on a lot. Can the US even transfer over into TikTok on China or is it a separate platform? I think it's separate. Yeah, TikTok and Douyin. That's is, like, so interesting. Separate. So the places that are popular in China are probably completely different than... But Chinese exactly. people travel a lot. There's a yeah. huge market for traveling in, yeah. in Asia, right? It would be interesting from a tourism perspective to be the guy who like bridges the gap and makes media for Chinese tourists. Yeah, exactly. There's a huge market out there. Totally. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Who do you think? Well, this is a dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Forgive me. Who do you think is happier? Like, of like, which which continent in the world do you think has the happiest people on average? That's a that's a difficult one. That's a tough one, right? But I think I've seen like reports from. So like the peace index and like the people who are the happiest in the world, like it, it's always some uh, West African country that comes on top, if I'm not mistaken. Like West Senegal, African. yeah, Senegal or like those countries, like they're, yeah, they're reported to be How like the it? happiest places on earth. They're like not the wealthiest, and like the people who say that they're super happy, they they don't necessarily have like the the most resources. But I feel like the more developed your country is, the more people have something to complain about. Well, I wanted to talk to you about that actually because. Like Japan's kind of a great example of that, to be honest with you, where it's like, I'm sure there's tons of happy people in Japan. I'm sure there's tons of happy people in the U.S., but lots of people in the U.S. are very depressed and lots of people in the U.S. are killing themselves. And like, it's not looking good, even though we are a developed country, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it in comparison to places like Japan. But Japan is an example where it's like aesthetically and like on the outside kind of perfect it's kind of paradise it's clean yeah but there are a lot of like social issues in japan each country has their pros and cons and stuff that they're strong on and other stuff that has room for improvement i think japan is a great country in many ways it also has its fair share of issues i think the work-life balance in japan is terrible um which is probably the leading cause of the suicide rates in japan um so yeah, I mean, Japan is, is great in many ways. It still has a lot of stuff that you can work on. For me personally, I feel very comfortable in Japan because one, I'm at home. I'm at you know my home base in a way. I speak the language. Um, but also everything is very convenient and practical in Japan. Like the city and the urban planning is made for convenience. The I know, metro is like very sure. efficient and like yeah. everything is clean. You've got like the 7-Elevens and, and but, vending but machines everywhere. But what I'm everywhere. saying is like that is great and it is a great place to travel. But it's like from a happiness perspective i don't think it necessarily does much because even yeah you know what i'm depends. saying it's it's like it's i just think the countries on the outside for the more i travel the more i'm like the guys that i was just shooting with who are peruvian right this is the first time in new york and they're walking around and like oh yeah new york's pretty cool like this is cool but like peru's sick and they they seem way happier than anybody else that's in new york they right. they don't have phones or even things that's interesting so for context i was just we're in new york right now i was filming a commercial for the peruvian tourism board and we were filming peruvians walking around the city and these peruvians 
like they're never on their phones in Peru. They're, they have cell phones, but they're not on them. They just take pictures with them. And what's, what's fascinating is there's a group of 30 of them. And at some point they started to kind of get lost a little bit, but they would always find their way back to the group really naturally. Like there was a much more awareness of what was happening around them. Whereas I think if you took like people not from a country like Peru who are on their phones more, it's like, we don't even know where to go without our phone. But the point is they were very genuinely happy in a way that you don't see in countries like New York. Like the, the countries that I go to that are developed are, cons- fuck it, are consistently um, not as happy, which is, which is weird. Yeah, it's right? interesting. I think the less stuff people have, the happier t- they tend to be. That they are. Yeah. Inherently. Like I do see that across the board. Mm-hmm. It's tough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a tough one. I think... Um, Oh, we got to get out of here. So we'll wrap it up. But we, we talked about a lot of interesting stuff. I really appreciate you being on the podcast. I appreciate you having me on your podcast. Hopefully we can do this again because yeah, you have so much knowledge that, that I think people will really find useful and interesting. Hey, I'm always happy to talk. <laughs> All right. Where can the people find you? Uh, on Instagram, mainly. I'm also on TikTok active. But Jerome, Jerome Traveler, Traveler right? on Instagram. Uh, Traveler spelled with two L's, the British way. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Perfect. All right, guys. I'll catch you guys next week. Another episode of Globe Focus. See ya.